Thank you for joining me today, Seema. How are you doing? Thank you. Thank you for having me, Anisha. I'm good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So I wanted to ask you, what's your guilty pleasure when it comes to food? Okay, so when it comes to food, I think the topmost guilty pleasure would have to be chocolate, always chocolate. I mean, what is life without chocolate, right? Always, always. Um, Chocolate has a particular way about the way that it enters and melts into your mouth. There is a there's a certain um, consistency to it that just kind of um, it just does it for you. It it sort of <laughs> invades every little taste bud, every little nerve ending. It just has something good. Did you know, for instance, that um, the ancient Incas, the ancient Colombians, thought of chocolate as the food of the gods, mm-hmm. as opposed to gold, which we, which they thought was god body. So it wasn't as important, but chocolate was the food of God. And which is why the Spaniards um, committed the kind of um, massacre that they did, because when they got to Montezuma's secret hoard, there was chocolate, there was coke beans in there, um, as opposed to gold. And so there was this massacre because they thought they were hiding it all there. But yeah, chocolate for sure. But um, having grown up, having sort of become an adult, having tasted chocolate through the years, I have to say, it has to be just right. Okay. The, 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 not just the taste of it, even the temperature. Okay. I do not like chocolate that's been in the fridge. It, room temperature, always. Always room temperature. But do you like, are you, do you prefer the percentage of cocoa? So, you know, is it 70% or 60% or like, I do like the I do like the um the dark dark chocolate. So I'm mm-hmm. happy with ninety. I'm also good with ninety five if it's a really good quality. Because okay. chocolate has to be really rich, and it has to have that peel to it. But like I said, it also has to be either room temperature or slightly higher than room temperature. So it it literally will melt on your mouth and slowly. It has to melt slowly. Yeah. like you can't bite if you bite it, it's bitter. Absolutely. Yeah, it has to spread onto your tongue. Yeah, like, it has oh to be goodness. it has to be silky and sensual and you know when it just coats and it's just oh it's just essential. And it leaves you feeling fabulous. Yeah, always. And it's yeah, like the after effect is like oh yeah, you've made me fantasy <laughs> like chocolate with some like I don't know Mozart and pumpkin spice so, oh, okay I'm thinking of all sorts of things I love <laughs> so I want to talk to you about the Kama Sutra for me it's not merely an instrument to satisfy our desires I feel like the book emphasizes importance of love family the art of eating well as, as well and I've come to see now that there, there's been a loss of art when it comes to eating people just eat on the go they don't talk about the food and I find that there's been a less it's been a loss in experiencing you know how a fellow you know diner expresses you know the delicate touch of a spice melting on his taste bed or you know it's like a symphony it's it's connecting with what you're eating have you found that as well in terms of the work that you do so um we talk about the Kama Sutra, for instance, and most people, as you know, think of it as a book of positions, and it's not. It's um, There's so much more to it. But the Kama Sutra actually has some very interesting stuff to say about food. And I really want to tell you this because I think it's one of those little hidden bits of information that will never come out unless somebody actually talks about it. So first thing, it says that there is every single food in the universe has at some point been used or thought of as an aphrodisiac, everything. Um, Either because of its shape, either because of what it was doing at a particular time. So for instance, the potato, I mean, you know, it was Henry VIII's favorite aphrodisiac. (laughs) The potato, the little old potato. Yeah, and why? Because um, this is at a time when in Britain, there's a lot of poverty, you know, people are sort of, they don't have enough to eat. And suddenly in 1600 and something, I think that was the date, I can't remember, but maybe a little bit mm-hmm. earlier, the potato arrives in Britain and in Ireland particularly, you know, the, the, the potato arrives where there's a, a great deal of poverty at this point. 
suddenly people have a sustainable meal. They have something that they can they can fill their stomachs up with. And the moment okay. their stomachs are full and they're happy, um, they have more children. They can, you know, they can think of other parts of their mm-hmm. life. They end up having more children. So the church actually de- actually had declared it an unchristian food. Wow. Wow. Oh, you have but to look this up. It's a fascinating history. I need to. Because when I think of the potato, I can see it. Maybe being an aphrodisiac, if you have lashings of butter and it's really creamy and when you eat it, it's like, it's it's just, yeah. Sin, like, potatoes are feel-good like food, that. right? Yeah, yeah. potatoes are food, feel-good food. But, but it is actually considered a huge aphrodisiac. So like I said, the Kam Sutra says, Every food at some point has been considered an aphrodisiac, but the Kamsutra then goes on to break everybody's heart and says, um, there is nothing that you can literally put in your mouth and it'll make you an amazing lover. It's not going to happen. Oh. Oh. Okay. Um, Why? But there are different... <laughs> Because unfortunately, it's not you have to work towards. But uh, there are different things that you can eat which will make you feel a certain way. And mm-hmm. so the Kamsis just says that the ultimate aphrodisiac, like I said, I'm going to break your heart. The ultimate aphrodisiac is something that will dispel wind. Oh, nice. It's a release aspect. <laughs> Basically, for good arousal to take place, you have to have a good blood flow to the genitals. And if you have bloating, it's not going to work. And so the ultimate aphrodisiac <laughs> is something that will get rid of the wind. Like I said, you know, it's not as exciting as thinking of sort of chocolate melting onto your tongue, but um, a lot more useful. Uh, <laughs> I know, I know. But, okay, I'll tell you the bit that I really love, okay? It says that you should never have food before making love. Okay. You always need I can see why. Because, yeah, when you eat, uh, your body is going to use its energy either to digest the food or to send the blood to the sexual organs. It will definitely pick automatically to digest the food. Mm-hmm. Love making after eating is never going to meet up. It's not, never going to meet your expectations, basically. But what so, I love is, it says, I mean, if you're going to, it's funny because it says if you're going to have a meal and then make love, you need to wait a couple of hours. And it also has certain games that it says that the host would have organized so if you'd invited somebody for a dinner party after that you would have organized certain games and things that people would have participated in to give you that time to digest your food before you went away to be with your lover uh but 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 let me just tell you this bit because (laughs) i just think that's exciting it talks at length about how the food should be eaten after making love. And I think that's what's really special. Okay. Okay. So it's not that it says, okay, you know, you go and have your nice big meal after that. It tells you how to have that meal. So it says that as the man, you would have invited the woman over and it is the man's job to now provide this meal afterwards. He says that it should be um, finger foods, not messy sort of gravy ridden foods because it needs to look nice when you're eating it as well. So okay. finger foods. It says that you need to have a minimum of five different tastes, but ideally eight different tastes on this plate. And you would pick up each thing. The man would pick up each thing. He'd bite into it and say, oh, this is sweet. It's very nice. Here, try this. And then he would offer it to the woman and okay. so on. And at the same time, there would be goblets of drinks that would be put over there. So he would have her, he would have her lap, uh, her head on his lap. This, and if the weather was good, you would be outdoors. He would point out to different stars. He would tell her really nice stories. So things that would keep her occupied, make her feel that yeah, it was a good idea that they had sex. You know that it was that particularly having sex with him was a good idea. So he would tell her different okay. stories, and then they would share the drink from the same goblet. So it was all about the beauty of presenting it because that's half the excitement. I really like that because uh, I do have two questions. The goblet is actually my next question, but um, 
when they were playing the games, were there games that were interactive to lead them into the central moment of eat, um, you know, into lovemaking or eating? Or was it just normal no, these games? Particular, no, these particular games were not actually um, games. Either. This was These were games that were, so you would have had a dinner party, you would have had other guests over there. And, <laughs> okay, so the games were either quail fighting or cock fighting. Nothing exciting about it, but it is one of the 64 skills of the Kam Sutra oh, wow. because a host who did things like that uh, was considered to be a really good host. Wow. You know, somebody who organized these things. And then I love the idea that when that time has elapsed, and because, you know, it is slightly interactive where, you know, you're you're standing next to each other, you're cheering on these quails and cocks, sort of, whatever it is that you're doing around these games. And do you know what a pawn is? You know, the right. beetle right. the beetle leaf with the arica oh, okay, yeah. in it, which is very okay. yeah. yeah. So um, there were different types of pawn that were used by lovers uh, wow. as messages. Yeah, so, you know, because this is a time before WhatsApp. Right, and okay, for sure. There's a lot more that lovers might need to say aside from saying I love you. There's a lot more that you might need to say. And so uh, the pawn had a very, very erotic vocabulary. You could send different types of pawns with different shapes, different fillings, different ways of holding it for different messages. But I love the idea that at the end of the dinner party, at the end of the games, if the man feels that, okay, now he's had enough of the games and, you know, the food is digested, he's ready to be with his mistress, he would actually serve pawn with cinnamon. And that was a hint for his guests to leave. Oh, oh, wow. Oh, I like, this is like love letters, but a, a more, I think it's a more sensual way of writing a love letter. You know, I think it's more creative and something that's lost today, 100% lost today. I really do think so. And which actually lets me to my next question. You mentioned the goblets of, of wine. So I've seen a lot of paintings and, you know, a lot of tapestry things that we have in so many South Asian households. So, you know, you see images of red wine goblets spilling and, you know, a handsome man leads passionately into his heroine. You know, the woman's got a huge skirt and a fitting jolly that's been caught off guard on the terrace. You know, it's very poetic, these beautiful paintings. And you can see in this painting the intensity of the gaze between them, you know. And there's this, I think there's a lot we can learn from this intimate yet dramatic paintings. But have you found that society now has lost this type of passion between themselves in terms of appreciating one another? So a lot of people say to me that, you know, people in the past obviously had more time and they had more leisure to indulge in all this. And maybe they're right. Maybe we do live a, a slightly more fast paced life now. And there are other things to think about. But I just think that, you know, when we talk about goblets, for instance, um, today you're on the run and you would grab um, you'd grab a can of Coke and you would drink mm -hmm. it straight from the can. I just think that if you took a little bit of time to pour it out into a glass, it changes the mm -hmm. taste of the drink. You pour it out into a really beautiful glass. It changes the way that you approach mm -hmm. that drink. And yeah. I think it's little things like that that could make all the difference in the world. I went out recently and I bought myself, because it's something that I absolutely love the idea of. I don't like um, matching crockery. I don't like okay. matching dinner plates and so on. So I went up to Hey On Why, which is the only place where I found a shop where they were willing to sell me single plates. And I bought this entire range of plates with different patterns, different designs, different things. And whenever I have a dinner party and I serve food on those plates, one of the things is always everybody first taking the time to absorb what their specific plate looks like. It's okay. a whole conversation before we even start the eating. That's nice. It changes the experience, doesn't it? It is. It's attention to detail as well, that you've got to. And I just love the idea that, you know, when you sit down to eat, yes, it's not always possible to sit down and say to yourself mm -hmm. that you're going to have a beautifully served meal. But every now and then, I think you should treat yourself to that because you're worth it. Oh, I love that. That should be another motto for people to go. Take a step back and do this because it does change your mindset. And I think it's so 
beautiful and organic to do so. And like the other thing that I want to tell you, just sorry, since we're yeah, on that, that's fine. <laughs> which I just think is really fun. So a lot of the, um, as I said, you know, there were there were different things that people used to message each, each other. Lovers would use different things to message each other. Mm -hmm. And I did a reel some time back saying that if you were to receive turmeric on Valentine's Day from your your lover, would you be like, I'm going to slap the hell out of you? You know, how dare you send me healthy turmeric? Or would you be excited? Yeah. So basically, as I said, that lovers used lots of different things to message each other each other with because at this time when you didn't have paper and pencil even, forget about, you know, WhatsApp on phones. And one of the things was you, you used whatever was to hand. Okay. And one of the things was the condiments in your kitchen. Okay. So each condiment had its own message. So you would send one, let's say, which was, let's let's say, um, I can't remember each one right now because I have them listed in my book, but you'd send one, which was, let's say, cumin, which said, I'm looking forward to meeting you tonight. Meet wow. me tonight. And then somebody else would send a clove back saying, no, no, I can't meet you because somebody suspects I can't come. And then they would I... send the turmeric. And then they would send the turmeric saying, Oh, it's okay. The danger has passed. I will see you tonight. Oh, this is incredible. This is absolutely incredible. Oh, my and God. So, so you definitely would have wanted to receive turmeric on Valentine's Day because it's like, yeah, yeah, I can come and see you. Um, so I just love how food, which was the most basic thing that was available to people, becomes mm -hmm. part of the pleasure vocabulary, part, becomes part of the love vocabulary um, as default. Yeah, I feel like there's been a loss of that in our culture. I really do. I, I, I feel like, you know, we have such a rich, beautiful culture, but a lot of this storytelling and romance and, and connection has been lost. And, you know, I just remember seeing these beautiful paintings of opulent clothing and, you know, these paintings showing some sort of, seductive fantasy between a man and a woman or a man and a man or a woman and a woman or you know a man and his concubine it was always very it's just well presented that I don't know it, it's, it's a type of sensational pleasure from viewing them but even as a child you recognize that there's something beautiful and romantic happening there and there's been a loss of that and it'd be so beautiful to get it back, you know? Yes, absolutely. I think the word is um, sensation. I mean, this is, it's the, it's the idea of having lost the pleasure vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Because the word pleasure becomes a bad word suddenly, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, the connotations of pleasure is a bad thing and suddenly nobody wants to talk about that. So the fact that eating a certain type of food could make you feel sexy, yeah. it was like, oh my God, how can you talk like that? You know, you're a bad yeah. person for speaking like that. So, yeah, I just think that, you know, it is a very sensual pleasure. Mm. Eating is a very sensual pleasure. The fact that we eat with our hands is, you know, it, it, it's part of that whole thing of feeling the food yeah. as you put it into your mouth. Um, there, there's this lovely thing, as I was saying, there's a whole pleasure vocabulary around pan. Um, there was this idea that when a woman um, felt, you know, this was part of the foreplay routine. Yeah. So after you, after a woman felt that she'd had her fill of foreplay, she was ready to move into the next phase and mm -hmm. actually make love. She would make a pan and give it to her lover, oh, or give it to her partner, and that meant yes, I'm ready for the next step. And if it was a new bride, the man would actually make it and take a bite and give it to to his new mm -hmm. bride or his new partner because it's the first time she would feel the touch of his lips on hers just from him having bitten oh, it's just so romantic sexy, isn't it it's like, so it's romantic beautiful yeah it, 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 how do you how do we lose that even for instance i and the, the worst of it is unfortunately we're left with half stories so mm -hmm. for instance people are always going on about how the um the the um chosen aphrodisiac of casanova was the oysters mm -hmm. and it isn't that the oysters, eating the oysters, are going to make you a great lover. Mm -hmm. um, there's a fabulous story from one of his personal diaries where he talks about how he used to, his oyster game. Ooh. So he's sitting with these two young women 
in Italy. And um, what he does is he gives one of them this oyster. And just as it's about to go into her mouth, he turns his hand ever so slightly so it falls down her neck and goes into her dress. And then he says to her, he says, no, no, this is mine. This is my oyster. And so I will retrieve it. And then he goes into detail about how he unlaces her bodice and he goes all the way down her body and he manages to pick it up without touching her. But he talks about the sensation, the anticipation, the excitement. And he says, it's the best love making that he's ever had. Oh, my heart is racing just <laughs> listening to you. <laughs> oh my God, this is so amazing. Oh my God. So yeah, good. so it's all, you know, the ancient Chinese emperors, their concubines were known as the Spice Girls. And their houses would be plastered with a combination of uh, Szechuan peppers and mm -hmm. plaster because it had this really warm feeling, um, this warm aroma. Food is just so exciting. You just know, need to know how to have it properly. It's like driving a car. It's how yeah. once you've learned to master it, it's open to so many possibilities. Oh my goodness. I feel so excited right now. <laughs> it's like, see, so, you know, I feel like there is a strong sense of sensuality running through Indian art, early Indian art, you know, from literature to folk tradition. And it's expressed in various forms from food to, you know, swelling bosoms, broad hips. Um, that, showing nudity which is you know you see the paintings and it's just so it's like your body and mind are fully immersed into everything that they represent in that painting it's, it's a movie that you're watching from the sensations to the environment mm -hmm. they're in and it brings you it kind of brings you up without a sense of censorship because it's in your home so no one questions it but you know it's there and there's no holding back there's no denial Existing in all that is happening right now, you know, it's happening in that second, it's it's there in that moment, and I see food in this way. I, I find it, like you said, eating with a hand, it's one of our senses, the touch, and how you put it into your mouth is an art form, and how it, you know, if it drips down your hand, it's it's like, how do you, it's just, everything is emotion. Um, and do I you feel know, like... Um, when, my, when I wrote the book, um, one of my friends who had a little... Um, she she had a little party for me to launch the book. And she actually had this fabulous chef come in who created certain types of food, which were very much about... And then what she did was she made us all sit in sort of alternate sort of man, woman, man, woman. Um, we weren't paired up with anybody, but she made one person um, wear a blindfold and the other person actually had to oh, feed wow. them something. And then the other way around where, you know, you wore the blindfold, they had to feed, feed you something. And you know what? it just changes the sensation of the food because suddenly you don't know what's coming into your mouth. So you can't anticipate it. Yeah. And then there's this burst of flavor in your mouth and it's just like, oh. Did that, I think that's quite orgasmic. I mean, it is. It's so orgasmic because you've lost one of your senses, sight. Yeah. So what you receive in your mouth is like, oh, it's the whole way as well. It's the way the person will put it into your mouth. Because, you know, sometimes you can have, I don't know, let's say a chili pepper and it just, Raises your lip, yeah, and then the tease you with it, and I think that is quite exciting. In so many, in so many forms, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. And I think this is something that our culture reflects. And do you think it's something that we are missing nowadays? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, for various reasons. Like I said, <clears throat> between the fact that everybody feels that they're in a real hurry. Um, the other, because the word pleasure has become so taboo, it's become such a bad word. The idea that you would actually indulge your senses in something where you would make it want to sort of arouse you, that has become a bad word. I mean, it's just, there are very few people who are comfortable having a dinner party and saying, do you know what, today I'm inviting a chef over to cook things that I just want you to roll around in your mouth and on your tongue for a little while and feel that because everybody starts to feel just a little bit uncomfortable because you're thinking, mm, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, 
um, should I be feeling like this in public? Should I be feeling like this in front of other people? It's fine if it's a chef's mm -hmm. table experience in a restaurant and everybody's gone there to do this. But on an everyday basis and an everyday, uh, in everyday life, we don't do that because we, we think of it as simple. But why do you think the words such as pleasure, um, orgasmic, these sort of terms that are just, they are just normal words that express, has such a deep meaning. Why do you think they've become such a taboo topic? Because I don't think, I think society's changed, but I don't think they should be, they should have a negative connotation to it because it's something that we should express as a normal yeah, everyday how and when it changed it, it is an evolutionary thing I guess you know as society changed um, it's also part of control isn't it because mm -hmm. if you if you think I mean like I said I, I was saying to you earlier that you know I put up a reel today about the fact that um, you know a woman's vagina is a healthy smelling a normal smell in a normal healthy vagina is a very exciting smell and you know, because so many women come to me saying, oh, my God, you know, I feel traumatized. My boyfriend said this about my vagina, etc." cetera. There's, there's a lot of negative comments around it. So just trying to say to women, it's absolutely OK. It's a beautiful part of your body. Um, if you take a look at the comment section, the mm -hmm. anger that is over there from people who don't even own vaginas, <laughs> you know, um, it's unbelievable. So I, I just think that this is also part of the... Um, it's part of the control because if a woman has the ability to own her own pleasure, um, mm -hmm. she's just that little bit less able to be controlled. Yeah. She has a and I, I think that's true. You know, like I have um, when I first dated well, my now husband, we always, as our dates, we always used to um, feed each other because he thought she would have a pot. We did not have any plates. Um, and the point was to have trust in one another, you know, and feed each other, I don't know, mussels or clams and he'd cook and it's a whole thing of when you are together as one, so much can happen. And and I think it's just such a beautiful experience to have that freedom amongst yourselves without any any sort of like hindrance or barriers or anything like that. And I think it's really hard to find that in people that are 100% comfortable in expressing every forms of pleasure, you know? Yeah. It's, it's and it's hard. just the senses. A lot of people who would say to me, I'm asexual. That's fine. This is not about sex. This is about your mm -hmm. senses. Yeah. We are not asensual. We are all sensual. Yeah. You know, explore your senses. Yeah. Always. And I think food is one of my favorite ways of exploring the senses. And and I feel like if we become more present within ourselves, in exploring our senses and our sensual experience that food ha that food has to offer, we allow it to resonate within ourselves. And you pay close attention to your body's response to that specific moment, you know. Is, and I think food is a wonderful lover, not a person. I think it's a wonderful lover for yourself. And is this, I am finding that this is a side of people that they are afraid of exploring. If they let go and enjoy this, what, I don't know, what a chocolate has to offer and you relax with yourself and let it melt, as we were saying before, they feel free and liberated and, you know, explore new realms of their body, talking to them. And having your, you know, your sessions, your cooking, you know, your YouTube show and the talks you've done, have you been able to explore this with people? So actually, we started something called um, the Karma Kitchen, which is, um, you know, between a, a friend of mine, Radhika, who is a chef. And uh, we just thought we'd sort of play around with some of these stories where I would come up with a story and then she would try and make a dish sort of inspired by that story so we have explored some of these stories we've had a lot of fun with them mm -hmm. I, I think that there's a lot more that we are going forward and looking forward to um mm -hmm. doing um, it, it's also the restrictions of 
<laughs> I'm sorry. It's also the restrictions of time and space that sometimes, you know, stop us from going exactly how far we'd like to go. But um, no, I think there's a lot of stories out there that need to be explored. I just want people to start looking at food as a sensory experience once again. Mm. Yes. And not just something that keeps body and soul together. I think so. And I think, you know, they say that when you're cooking, there's a state of joy found in cooking because you're trying to create something for that person. Like the little message you she said that they've sent their lovers, the fun. And I think that's so, oh, that is so fantastic. And I think there's a loss of, because of the chaos we live in sometimes with our lifestyle of our modern life, food is an aspect of creating edible art you know it's so, so colorful it's so colorful yeah. and it invokes a profound sense of exhalation in a true sensualist and it's an intimate connection to the bodily pleasures that can soon be encountered once you start enjoying it but now there's a strong sense of urgency I find that needs to be explored in a world that's undiscovered with so many beautiful pleasures when it comes to food and the senses do you think people will be open to exploring this? I certainly hope they will, Anisha. I don't know. You know, um, like I said, you can never quite tell how strongly somebody is going to react to the idea of bringing something back to the idea of pleasure. Because, as I said, the word pleasure has just become such a bad word suddenly. Um, I just feel that everything eventually leads to um, somewhere there's a little sort of point inside us which is where all of that pleasure um, erupts from or where it's sort of con where it's contained and to tap into it and whenever you use the word pleasure people automatically think of sex and it isn't it comes in mm -hmm. so many different ways mm -hmm. and I think food is definitely one of them and I do hope that like I said I understand people have busy lives we're all you know eating on the run every now and then I know I'm going after this podcast I'm going to jump into my car drive down somewhere grab something in my hand halfway through shovel it into my mouth fair enough it's gonna happen <laughs> but so long as I also understand that there is an alternative and that I will explore that side of it too okay. and I think restaurants that um, create these experiences are um, fantastic because I think that you can't do it at home for whatever mm -hmm. reason um yeah. You know, go out and explore this, explore the experience. Um, I think that a lot of the brands in the UK, for instance, I think Tesco started something called Food Love Stories, oh, wow. Wow. Uh, which were just really sweet. I mean, they again, they weren't sort of about sex. They were just really about sort of being attached to something. And they were very cute. They were really sweet. M&S did this whole thing of saying, you know, uh, eat in with them. So there was like this 10 pound dinner that you could have, which was really fabulous. And I think that it's about understanding that it gives you pleasure and to take the pleasure. Definitely. And I think, do you, do you think like, you know, food is one aspect of it, but this this sense of pleasure can be enhanced by poetry or classical Hindustani music and other syn synesthetic elements? I think uh, anything that actually slows you down so that you will partake of the sensation. You know, there's that wonderful Buddhist story where it talks about this monk who is running through the forest and there's a tiger chasing him and he's running as fast as he can and the tiger's catching up. And then suddenly he gets to the edge of um, the, 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 well, to the edge of a ravine okay. and he slips and he falls. And as he falls, there's a tree growing out of the uh, out of the side of the mountain. And he grabs that, mm -hmm. and the story ends with him holding on to this for dear life. Because if he up above him is the tiger, so he can't go up, and he can't go down because the ravine is over there. So either way, it leads to death. And at this point, he has absolutely nothing else that he can do. There is nowhere for him to go, okay. and there is a berry growing on that little branch just at that point. And he takes the berry and he puts it into his mouth. And it says that it was the most amazing berry he had ever tasted. <laughs> you know, it is literally about just giving it your attention. Yeah, and also giving in to it, to, to, you know, feed your attention, you know? Yeah. And a lot of people 
I feel don't do that. And I think it's a shame because I think so many areas we can kind of dive into, which is being lost. And it'd be nice to be we center ourselves in order to achieve that. And experience that moment. It's, it's really curious. I, I, I find I find this sort of thing where you embrace these moments, it gives you the most wonderful experience. And it I, is. Yeah. It's literally about the experience. Yeah. And, and, you know, I found that, you know, when I was doing some research as well, I, I found that peacocks symbolise erotic love. I do not know why, but I would love to know why. And they're always attached to our wedding garments. You know, I realised on my wedding skirt, I had peacocks and I was like, oh, this is beautiful. But aside from love, do you think there's a deeper meaning to having peacocks as a symbol of relationships? So actually, I don't know. I think it's just because they look so beautiful that they're part of that symbolism. Um, in our mythology, in the in the stories that come from India, the peacock um, has a very different connotation. So the peacock is the ride for the god of war, the god okay. of battle, Karthik. He rides on a peacock. And the reason for that is because they say that the peacock has the most incredible digestive system. They can digest anything that they eat whether it's poison or broken glass or whatever, but it has the strongest stomach. Mm -hmm. And so in yoga, for instance, the um, morasan, the, the peacock posture in yoga is supposed to make your stomach really, really strong. Okay. And that's why he becomes, because um, that's why it, it is the, uh, the ride for the god of war, because they believe that your strength lay in your core, in your stomach. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so, yeah, I, I, I know that that's the symbolism that we have for the peacock. And yes, it does come right back to what you eat. But as I said, we only have half stories now. So it yeah. comes back to what you eat. But because it's a beautiful looking bird, most people have sort of lost the, the real meaning of it and okay. come back down to this. So, yeah, could be that. It's curious because I think as well throughout our art, uh, there's always a common theme, you know, a prince with a wine goblet, a woman surrounded by beautiful, vibrant flowers, all contribute to a vivid theme. What makes these paintings so beautiful for you? And I think, is it the fact that it reflects such opulence and expressing the scene? You know, do you find it is about being present with the senses or capturing the beautiful moment that is between the people in that painting because a lot of the paintings were actually taken of actual people in that moment so for me these paintings are um they become even more beautiful initially it was sort of an aesthetic ex um uh, excellence you know an aesthetic sort of pleasure that you get from it and you think oh god mm -hmm. this is so beautifully done over time, as I've been studying the Kam Sutra and I've been studying all of the literatures around um, erotica, I think it's because I understand the symbolism now. And that makes a huge difference um, mm -hmm. to how you appreciate a piece of art. So I, I just love the symbolism that is in there. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, in the Kam Sutra um, or in ancient Indian literature, every position was denoted through a piece of jewelry. So you didn't actually say, oh, she climbed up on top or whatever. There was a piece of jewelry that was attached to every position because that's what you would wear as part of your lovemaking. So if you were on top, the idea was that you wore a jingling girdle because to be on top, you're not supposed to move your body. The right way of doing this position is where you only move your hips. So that you had to make sure you wore these, these belts and made sure that the belts didn't make a sound. Oh wow! Yes, oh wow! Yes, yes. So there, there are, there's a whole series on the kind of jewelry that you'd wear. So, for instance, when you look at a painting and you see a palm folded up in a particular way, now I'm looking out to see how that palm is folded as to what okay. the message might be that would have been sent between one and the other. Um, or it, there was also a way of how you handed the pawn. So if you gave it like this, it meant something else. If you gave it like this. It, so I'm now looking out for those gestures because there's an entire story behind it. Mm -hmm. 
So for me, it just gets more exciting, you know, like what kind of flowers have they put in the background? Because again, that tells me what season it is. Um, depends on, you know, whether there is a sort of, um, is, is it sunrise, how they've colored the, mm-hmm. the, the, um, the, the sky. That would again tell you where you are with your, um, with your partner and what emotions are going on and basically the what the story is that's being told in that painting so it's, it's very exciting it's curious to say that because here my my husband's grandmother told me that back back in the day when you had your spanish fan with different yeah. ways of communicating um a message to your lover or a person you want to have a date with there were beautiful ways and I think I would love to know more about this but I thought it's a similar concept like you know each culture had their own way of these beautiful senses of like communicating through gestures you know, and it's, it's yeah, it's the yeah it's just the um, vocabulary it is in other ways other than writing or texting or anything like that so my last question to you is if there is a window into a bold, sensual representation into the 16th and 19th century art, how would you tell people to embrace it? If there was a window into the? The sensual representation of the art from the 16th to the 19th century, how would you tell people to represent it? Because that art shows so many fantastic but intimate moments. And considering what our society is like now, to trace back to these moments in our history, what sort of messages would you tell people, you know, to embrace these sort of moments? So I think uh, one of the big changes that has taken place um, in today's society, there is a lot more people who are on their own. So, um, and we have become conscious of the fact that there's a lot of people who are not necessarily with partners. Mm. And we've become more sensitive to maybe not always depicting the idea of love, joy, pleasure, or happiness mm. as two people being together. I think it's really important for, uh, for us to be sensitive about um, understanding that a lot of people are on their own. So that is one thing that I would definitely take into consideration. And the other is that it's something that we all now try and work towards is that pleasure, sensuality, excitement is something that comes from within you. It doesn't necessarily need somebody else to be over there. And so for that as well, I think it's quite nice if we could do maybe, if I was going to do a series of paintings, actually depicting um, people by themselves, a an individual, mm-hmm. um, with a particular, whether it was with food or whether it was with flowers or whatever, sort of doing something, but the expression on their mm-hmm. faces showing the joy that it brings. Mm-hmm. Or maybe even in the way that uh, their body posture is, you know, just sort of, because let's face it, there is a way that, you know, if you're not feeling very happy or the, the, your body is sort of tenses up. So there's a I think that you can tell when somebody's relaxed and happy. So, yeah, I think that's what I would like to encourage, you know, getting people to understand that their pleasure lies inside of them and that they are responsible for their own pleasure and they own it. Oh, I think you should do that. I think that's absolutely amazing because when you see, you know, some photographers to take, you know, photos of people in the street and when you say to them, you look beautiful or you smile at them, the whole face just changed from sadness to to happiness. And you see the laughter lines and the, the glee in their eyes. And so much can change from one word or an expression that can make someone in that moment feel so happy. I think you should definitely do this because I think it would be amazing. And it'd be such a good gallery in an art museum for people to go, ah, this is something that we should be following and doing for ourselves. I think that's the next project then, Anisha. 100%. I am 100% behind you. <laughs> yes. Um, see, see, it's been an absolute pleasure having you. And I've learned so much about certain aspects of embracing ourselves that I, I can't wait to pursue myself. So thank you so much. You're very, very welcome. And thank you for having me. Thank you.